Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a special privilege for me to be asked to moderate this conversation today. Uh, quite simply, I am a huge fan of Tweedy Brown. So thank you, George, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to sit down with the, the partners of this firm and, and, and have a wonderful discussion together. Um, I, I want to start by just reintroducing everyone very quickly um, who will be participating in this conversation today. We have five of Tweedy Brown's managing partners who are all members of the firm's investment committee with us. Bob Wyckoff, who you just heard from, John Spears, Tom Schrager, Roger Debris, and Jay Hill. I think it's important to note that these five gentlemen have almost 150 years of cumulative experience at Tweedy. 148 to be exact, if, I, if the bios are accurate and up to date on the Tweedy Brown website. That is just remarkable to me. Um, I should also point out that no senior investment professional has ever left Tweedy Brown to join another investment firm. Again, that's just remarkable to me, and I think it's a testament to the unique culture that exists at Tweedy Brown. So the theme for this conference today is in celebration of Ben Graham in a world that questions value investing. No investment firm has been more closely associated with the practice of value investing as originally articulated by Ben Graham than Tweedy Brown. At a celebration marking the 100th anniversary of Ben Graham's birthday during the 90s, uh, Warren Buffett made the following comment. The basic ideas of investing are to look at stocks as businesses, use market fluctuations to your advantage, and to seek a margin of safety. That is what Ben Graham taught us. A hundred years from now, they will still be the cornerstones of investing. To me, that is the essence of what Tweedy Brown has been all about for the past 101 years. Recognizing that market price and intrinsic value are not the same thing and trying to exploit that insight. Of course, in trying to exploit that insight, Tweedy Brown's always focused on minimizing risk by building a margin of safety into all of its de decision making. In his key keynote a few minutes ago, Bob described the Tweedy's colorful history and touched on the evolution of the firm's investment process. I thought what I'd like to do today, I thought it'd be both interesting and a great learning experience for everyone attending today, if we could do a deeper dive with our Tweedy panelists to get some more granularity about this evolution and also address in more detail just how the firm is going about its work today and what has been a difficult period for value investors. Time permitting, I thought we could end by exploring some of the broader behavioral principles that are critical to success as a value investor. So that's an ambitious agenda, so let's get started. So my first question, um, as Bob noted in his comments, Tweedy Brown started out as a broker and market maker in small, illiquid securities, and it was really in that context that the relationship with Ben Graham began. So my question to, to all of you is, is, do you think it's still possible to be successful with Ben's statistical approach, notably purchasing securities below net net working capital value in today's markets. Does Tweedy still make investments uh, using these criteria? And I see John with his hand up, so I'll let him go first. Well, the problem with it today is, is, uh, is largely capacity. But yes, I think you can still make some money with, uh, with net net current asset stocks. I. I personally, a few years ago, uh, bought a package of ten of around ten of them in Asia, uh, in in South Korea and Japan. The ones in in Japan did have a return on equity in addition to being below net working capital, but they they worked out. I don't know whether they beat the market, but I gradually peeled off most of them. Uh, I still own one called Motonic in South Korea, 0009680, which uh, has uh, 15,000 a share in, uh, in net current assets, of which uh, it's nearly all of its net cash, a very low return on equity, you know, 
average ROE over the last 10 years of three and a half percent, but it fluctuates, it bobs around. And I'm, I've done two round trips on it, re most recently 7,000 by six to 7,000 by, and it's now about 13,000. But so, yeah, I think you, I think you can, but you can't, you commercially can't, you can't do it. <laughs> Jay, I see. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just, Go ahead, John. Just to follow up, Jeff. I mean, what I would say is that the, the, the vast majority of the, the investments that we make today are attempting to buy businesses at 70% or less of a conservative estimate of intrinsic value with intrinsic value being defined as private market value, i.e. what would accrue to the shareholders if 100% of the company um, were put up for sale tomorrow, tomorrow to a knowledgeable third party. Um, and, and we make these private market value appraisals, as Bob mentioned in his speech, by observing M&A multiples, real world M&A transactions and trying to find companies that trade at big discounts to those multiples. And we're looking at enterprise value to EBITDA or EBIT plus merger amortization or enterprise value to EBITDA, PE, um, and in some cases, maybe even an enterprise value to sales. My guess today, if you look at our portfolio, something like 80% of the stocks that we own today, um, the appraisal, our, our uh, assessment of valuation was really an earnings-based derived valuation. Um, but I would also say that probably the, the remaining 20% of the stocks that we own um, are valued use, looking at asset value. Right. Um, or what I would call balance sheet derived valuations, um, where we're looking at buying at companies that, that, that trade at uh, either low price to book value or, as John mentioned, um, below, in some cases, even net current asset value. Um, now, in, in terms of price to book, I think we tend to use these more with financials like uh, banks or insurance companies or in certain cases, deeply cyclical businesses that have very volatile earnings records, but we ultimately think they're pretty good businesses and they're trading at large discounts to, to let's say tangible book value, as long as they have strong balance sheets. Um, and, and in our belief, they have staying power. We're willing to invest in those statistical based, more Ben Graham style value uh, investing as well. And, and so um, I think that di differentiates Tweedy Brown a little bit. We're willing to buy the better business like more of the, the the Buffett style of value investing, we're also willing to do more of the Ben Graham statistical bets. Uh, but to what Jay has said, it's Tom Shager speaking, I think it's very important to keep in mind that what has not changed uh, is the fact that we operate on a uh, on a framework. And that framework is, is that we buy stocks, uh, they trade at a significant discount from what Ben Graham called intrinsic value of what they are worth. This hasn't changed. It's just over the years, as net current asset stocks disappeared from the world, <laughs> with some exceptions, as John has said, in, uh, in Taiwan or Korea uh, or in Japan, we have increasingly moved towards buying stocks uh, based on earnings and earnings multiples uh, that may trade at, uh, at the premium to uh, book value and to tangible assets. But the framework hasn't changed. And the framework that, that, that Graham brought, brought to the business, and it was alluded uh, in Bob's speech here, is that uh, a, share is, uh, a share of stock is, a, is an interest in a business. And uh, when, when you uh, when you value you, you have to value that interest uh, in, 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 when you value that interest in the business, it's the equivalent of the collateral for a bond investors. You have to remember that Ben Graham came to the uh, equity investment business by by first starting in the in the bond business, and at that time in the twenties and thirties, you know, collateral was very very important. It was almost more important than uh, cash flow. So the intrinsic value to business is the collateral to the business. And if you're buying at the 30 or 40 percent discount from that value, you are investing with collateral. And that hasn't changed. Anybody else? 
Um, well, maybe we'll move on. Um, as you alluded, Bob, in, in, in your comments earlier, an important strategic change took place in the late 50s when Tweedy took a, what I describe as its first baby steps towards starting a money management operation. And, and that occurred when, when Tom Knapp joined the firm from, from Graham, Graham Newman and began managing the partner's investment capital in a separate account. Um, also important around that time was the arrival of Ed Anderson from Reeler Munger in the 60s, um, bringing the firm's first outside uh, investment clients. So I guess my question is, is just this. So clearly the, the firm was changing operationally at that time, but would you would you also discuss uh, how Tweedy was involving its investment approach at that period in your in, in your history? John, I don't know if you want to take a... Well, let's see. Going back to when Ed Anderson came in, I think uh, with, with Tom coming over from, from, uh, from Graham Newman Corporation, he employed a very, very simple valuation approach that was it's very similar. It's along the same lines as we have now, but he might... He invested in these small, inactively traded stocks, and these stocks were often priced at at or below or very close to what the company would pay for that stock. So he had little, in a way, he had little downside. So he might be buying something at three times earnings when the overall stock market was 12 times earnings. And he knew that, you know, <laughs> he didn't have to do investment bank banking appraisals at three times earnings when the overall stock market was 12. And he'd buy into, uh, land companies in Florida like Deerfield Gross, and and he'd he'd figure, well, I I know that they have this many acres. I know it's it's in, it's near Vero Beach. I know that land, even <laughs> even kind of crummy agricultural land, goes for this hundred dollars an acre. And I divide the number of shares at, 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 into the number of acres, and I got this many acres per share. And I'm only paying five bucks an acre. You know, he'd do these things or, 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 or Belknap oil, barrels of oil or Timberland. He, you know, he, he, he was very sensible, but he, he, he did statistically based investing. I think at one time we might have had 700 or 1,000 stocks. But then from then, from that, it became more and more, you know, he was a, he was a well-trained analyst. He was a Princeton grad, very smart uh, well taught, went to went to Ben Graham's classes. That's how he was hired as an as an analyst. So he brought that that over. Uh, Howard Brown was kind of investing in these things through making markets because they were so illiquid, illiquid and obscure, ignored. Uh, but uh, Tom Tom brought that, and then we kept kind of going from there. Uh, Very good. Very good. Any anybody else have any particular comments around this period of time in in the firm's history? Okay. Well, to me, the probably the the, the biggest seminal moment in Tweedy Brown's history happened in the seventies when you registered as an investment advisor for the first time, um, and and those maybe the beginning steps of the firm uh, slowly phasing out of its traditional broker market making operation. Um, I'd also just comment around that time, you uh, FMC Corporation became the first institutional client of Tweedy Brown, and I believe actually doubled your assets under management uh, um, when they when they came on board. And understand that that Jim Clark, who who also joined around that time, had an enormous impact on the investment operations and approach. And the firm evolved and began to identify potential LBO candidates and utilizing acquirers multiples and, and comps in your <laughs> value in your, your appraisal models. So I, I, my question is just this, would, would you help us all to better understand the, the strategic considerations in becoming a registered investment advisor? And, 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 and then again, how at this next stage, the firm was, was evolving. And John, I'll throw that to you as well. <laughs> sure. Um, 
I hit before I joined Tweety Brown. I had I was a manager as a sideline business of two investment partnerships, and uh, one of the ideas that I came across was a closed-end investment company called Cambridge Fund that was priced at uh, at about five dollars a share, uh, and it had maybe eight bucks a share in 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 net assets, cash and marketable liquid marketable securities. So we started accumulating that in my little fund, and I I was using Tweety Brown as my broker, and they liked the idea too. So they started. They said, "Okay, okay, with you if you if we bought some." I said, "Yeah, sure. I you know I'm only managing three hundred thousand dollars. You you're managing a few million. So so they started accumulating it with the idea of of uh, gradually buying a controlling interest. Excuse me." I didn't unplug my phone. Very sorry. <laughs> they, they, they. We gradually acquired a, a, a controlling interest. We did a proxy fight. We kicked out the portfolio manager, Frank Abella, and we started managing it ourselves. So therefore, we had to become registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. But that coincided with our firm being mostly through me a takeover broker. I'd call it that. We would find companies that where control of the, of the stock was in the market and you could buy a five or ten percent position and tender for the rest of the of the company's shares um, and we would send out little pieces of paper that said well you know here's this company a we wouldn't give the name company B company C and we have all the numbers and we might say a little bit about what what field they were in but we didn't want to want to give them the tip off and we said, if you're interested uh, and you're willing to pay us, I think, 5% of the first million, four, three, two, one, and the next millions all the way up in buying this stock and then in tendering for the company, uh, we'll sign it. We'll, we'll have a deal and we'll give you the name and we'll talk about it. And this proved to be a, a kind of a successful scheme because we got to know a lot of Wheeler dealers of the era, like, like Ron Perlman, uh, there was a Forbes 400 guy in the real estate business uh, by the name of Arthur Cohen, um, Dyson Kistner Moran, uh, Leonard Green, Gibbons Green, Van Amarajan. We got to know these folks. And so it was interesting socially, but they also gave us more of a framework of valuation, of buying the entire company and looking at the entire capital structure, not just PE and ignoring the amount of debt that the company had or the amount of cash that the company had. So we, we became acquainted with that through these people. And that had an effect on how we were, how we were screening for stocks. And we even had a period of time where we were doing rate kind of rating ourselves, where we were buying five or 10% of a company, filing a 13 D and then trying to option our shares to one of these Wheeler dealers if they would be willing to make a tender offer for the entire company, and we'd split part of the increment if if they were topped by somebody else. So we were we were doing that. Then Jim came along with Whit, from Whitcom, John Hay Whitney's uh, Whitcom Communications, which owned the uh, the uh, International Peril, Paris Herald Tribune. It owned Corinthian Broadcasting, and he brought uh, a, a vast knowledge of media companies and how they were valued. 10 times EBITDA typically, and dollar for dollar for the working capital. Um, and we could buy things at big discounts doing that. And we became involved with a comp with people, uh, uh, Keith Gallus, Paul Tierney, and, and Gus Oliver, who founded a firm called Coniston Partners. They were raiders in the 1980s. We worked with them a lot. We I think we found them the idea for store broadcasting company, which... Uh, I think they tendered for maybe it was maybe it was Colbert, Kravitz, and Robert. I forget, but uh, we made good money on the, on uh, working with them on a number of uh, accumulation and uh, put it in play type deals. <laughs> very good, very good. Um, the next sort of evolution in in the firm uh, was the the change when uh, the firm adopted a global approach. 
And I guess I would just ask the question, and, and Bob, you alluded to it a bit in your comments, but can, can you tell us all why a firm that had been U.S. focused for the first 70 years of its existence made the move into global investing? And I know you've been on record as well as, as embracing um, currency hedging um, and, and that's been a big belief uh, uh, belief in the, the firm's uh, global approach. So um, just uh, address why you went global and, and maybe the, the importance of uh, currency hedging. And uh, I don't know, Tom, do you want to take a, a shot at that? Yeah, maybe I'll take a stab at it and uh, my partners can come back later. Uh, I think uh, the way it happened was that during the 1980s, before I arrived, I arrived at Indy Brown in 1989, uh, some of our uh, offshore clients were talking about, uh, about some incredible values that existed in stock markets uh, outside the United States. And uh, uh, as a firm, uh, we started looking on a stock-by-stock -stock basis, and we found such stocks as Rothmans, and distillers uh, that were trading at single digit multiples. Then uh, uh, we found some property and casualty companies in Japan that were trading at, at about a third of their uh, intrinsic value. Uh, so that uh, uh, I think uh, made it interesting for the partners at Treaty. So they looked for a foreigner, so they got me. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, for the first uh, uh, couple of years, uh, uh, it was uh, very, very challenging because uh, there were different accounting standards uh, internationally. In Germany, for example, they were trying to minimize the amount of earnings they were showing in the income statement and present a very solid balance sheet because banks were big investors uh, in those companies. Um, in the UK, uh, on the other hand, they were very loose with their uh, accounting numbers, trying to show profits in the best possible light. So you had to do a lot of work uh, to, understand, uh, to understand what was going on. But overall, it was much more of a, a treasure hunt than, uh, than uh, a minefield. Uh, in addition to that, there were very few people who uh, invested with a value tilt internationally. The most prominent one was obviously Jean-Marie Veillard, uh, who, who had an extraordinary record. But otherwise, there were very few people who did that. So the markets were relatively inefficient. And, um, and that, uh, for us, created an opportunity. However... When we thought about it, uh, we realized that volatility in, in foreign exchange can be much higher than volatility in stock markets and in individual stocks. So, you know, there are very few years over the last 50 years when on an annualized basis, uh, you had a, a drop of more than 20%. But there are many, many years uh, when you had huge swings in currencies over time. So uh, we then contacted uh, a professor at Harvard, Andre Perrault, uh, who had studied uh, currencies. And, and essentially he said, yeah, look, over long periods of time, over really long periods of time, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so by hedging, what you're essentially doing uh, is reducing volatility uh, because you can have great results in local currencies, the local currency is weak and uh, you have bad results in dollars, uh, investors don't have a long, a long uh, time horizon in their investments, they'll take their money out exactly at the wrong time, uh, right before the currencies are turning. And in our 27 years, I would say, uh, um, uh, since the Global Value Fund was started, uh, the MSCI index hedge has actually done a little bit better than the MSCI index in US dollar. So this theory has 
I think proven right, uh, at least over the last 27 years. Very good. Um, I can see we're, we're running out of time here, and I have more questions than we have time. So um, with, with George's indulgence, I'd like to sneak in two more quick questions if I could. And um, the first one is just that, you know, the firm continues to evolve, as, as you discussed in your comments, Bob. Um I'd like to just get a catch-all, and, and would you address your process for valuing high return capital compounders, um, businesses that have that are asset light, if you will, that have less hard assets, and 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 how these companies now factor into your investment framework, and and then I think everyone would would be very interested to hear your comments on the qualitative aspects of. Um, you know, businesses and the competitive sustainable advantages that, that a business might have. And yeah, Jeff, you have its management. So Jeff, uh, let me just start by saying, look, we're, we're attracted to businesses that qualitatively appear to have a moat. And I can tell you that one of the best books that I read early in my career was called The Little Book That Builds Wealth, written by a fellow by the name of Pat Dorsey. Um, this was a very influential book um, in my early career. I learned a lot from it. And the book really provides a useful framework for identifying and classifying moats in four primary areas. Um, and so I still use this today to sort of think about businesses. So, so the first is intangible assets. That's the first type of moat. And that's brands, um, patents um, that really allow for uh, above average pricing power, right? The ability to increase prices without uh, having a, 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 a large negative impact on demand. And I can tell you, if you look at the Tweedy portfolio, we have several companies that exhibit um, a competitive advantage in this area, whether it be Nestle or a Diageo. I'm going to give you a third one that I don't think is very common knowledge, but it's a company by the name of Case New Holland or CNH. Um, CNH is the second largest global uh, in terms of market share, in terms of high horsepower agricultural equipment. If you study the ag names, and really this is all three of the big players, Deere, Case New Holland, and Agco, these are businesses that despite it being a very cyclical industry, year in and year out are able to increase prices every single year. Um, I also want to point out just quickly, I have lots of relatives in Kansas. They're all farmers. They're, they happen to be case people. So they're only going to buy a case tractor or a case uh, uh, combine. And I have a nephew whose name is Case. <laughs> so if, if, if he was named Case after the, 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 the corporate brand. And so if that if that doesn't tell you about uh, the, really the value of brand power, I don't know what does. Um, the second moat criteria that that. That, that Dorsey talked about was switching costs. And right, this is where uh, the risk of switching providers outweighs the potential benefits of switching. Um, a great example of that in our portfolio today is a company by the name of Saffron. Saffron's primary business is manufacturing jet engines. And this is an industry, right, where product failure can lead to catastrophic accidents. If the engine fails, people could die. And so when Boeing and Airbus make a decision on what engine they're going to put into an airplane. It's a 20 plus year decision um, and, and you don't switch you, 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 or you can't easily switch. So that's a great example. The third criteria that Dorsey talks about is, uh, is network effects. Um, I personally think that network effects are the strongest moat, the, the most durable moat of all of the moat um, categories. Um, this is when a good or a service becomes more valuable um, when it's used by more people. The best example in the Tweety portfolio today is, is Google, which we were able to buy at, at a value price back in 2011 and 2012 after a, uh, a stumble in the transition from desktop computing to uh, mobile phone computing. We know, right, that the search engine um, is a product that improves over time as the more users use it. And so that's a, a great example of uh, network effects. And then the fourth mode that, that, that I think makes a lot of a sense to, to identify is what they call low cost provider, right? And this is where uh, a company has a cost advantage relative to its peers that allows it to earn 
in, in general, much higher margins. A great example in the Tweedy portfolio today um, is a company we own by the name of AutoZone. You guys are probably all familiar with AutoZone. They have 6,000 stores across uh, North America, um, primarily in the United States. Um, and the benefit that the business benefits from size and economies of scale um, that, that frankly, most of their competitors, which are mom and pop owned aftermarket auto parts stores, just can't replicate. And so AutoZone has clear margin advantages relative to the vast majority of their competition. The only company in their industry that earns margins that are similar um, is a business by the name of O'Reilly. Um, the one other, the, the, the final point that I would like to make, Jeff, about this is that the, once you've identified a qualitative moat, you think, okay, qualitatively, this makes sense. This company has a durable, sustainable, competitive advantage. I also think that moat needs to be validated by quantic, by quantitative evidence, right? And, and, and the quantitative evidence, I think, that you would look for um, or high returns on invested capital, um, pricing power and or uh, above average organic growth, right? Companies with the ability to grow organically at a much higher rate than global GDP. And then a third um, way to validate, I believe, a qualitative advantage is, is just to look at market shares over time. They're not available in every industry, but, but I can tell you, if you can find a company that has maintained market share or grown its market share over a long period of time, that's great evidence that a business has a sustainable competitive advantage. It touches uh, upon what uh, uh, what we use a lot internally, which is uh, value growth, right? So when I start looking at a stock, for example, I look immediately, and I think a lot of us do that at sort of 10, 15 years of economic history, and you calculate what you think the stock is worth for every single year, and then you try to f uh, see how the value goes up with time, because it's, as Jay has said, you know, the factors he's pointed at uh, make you aware whether time is your friend or your enemy when you're when you're investing in this business. So that then, you know, sort of that progression, and that can be driven by sales growth if the returns are high, and you can also destroy value if your returns are low. Uh, let's say if you're a container shipper, you can get a lot of growth, but you, you're not going to make a lot of money because you have low returns on these boats. Uh, so it can be sales growth, it can be increasing margins, it can be cheap uh, buybacks, uh, you know, you, you just have a lot of cash coming out of your business, so your debt goes down. Good M&A, all of this drives value growth, and it shows in the numbers immediately, and it's based on um, the kind of factors that, uh, that Jazz mentioned. So once you see a lot of value growth, you sit down and you think, okay, so now I have to understand why this takes place, and then you have to do the kind of analysis that, that Jay has pointed out. And, and, and Jeff, if you'll, if you'll let me make one more comment, Look, we all like better businesses, right? Yeah. With sustainable competitive advantages. But it, but as Bob mentioned in his speech, there's a distinction between a great company and a great investment. And that yeah. distinction is price. And so if you go back and you look, it, just think about the names that we just talked about, like AutoZone. Well, if you go back to 2017, the narrative in the marketplace was that Amazon was going to crush AutoZone due to selling more parts online and selling them at uh, vastly reduced prices. And there were reasons, qualitative reasons, why we believed that wouldn't happen. Um, you take a company like c &H, like right? the, the, the narrative in terms of agricultural equipment manufacturers up until very recently was, look, farmers across the world are broke. Farm income is declining. Crop prices are low. Um, there's too much used uh, equipment in in the at, at, at the dealers, um, which has a negative impact on on, on new equipment prices, um, and Trump tariffs right were uh, redu substantially reducing export demand for um, the, the 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 crops that were produced uh, in the United States. So you need you need real fear, right, um, in yeah. order to have a pricing opportunity in a business that has a durable, sustainable, competitive advantage. And, and that doesn't happen all the time. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Um, George, maybe I just, um, are we done? You, you want to get to Q&A or because I yeah. maybe just summarize with everybody uh, very quickly if you want it, but I'll leave it to you. Yeah, I think uh, we should go to a QA and a with the okay. audience and then perhaps you can come back uh, okay. to you. But thanks so much, uh, Jeff, for uh, moderating the panel. Uh, I'd like to open the floor now to questions to the Tweety Brown panel. Uh, by Zusha, 
Okay, I allow you to uh, please unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Hi, good evening from the United Kingdom. Um, yes, I've been following 2D Brown for quite a while, especially from one of the books I've read and everything, and very fascinating company. Um, I'm very curious about your company culture because, um, as previously mentioned, um, it, they stated that no partner has ever left to join the company. Um, so I'm just curious, like, to the partners, what makes you stay? And furthermore, um, as obviously as an upcoming investor, what does it take for one person to become a partner in such a well-cultured firm? Thank you so much. I, if I can uh, take a stab at that, I think we, we are all immensely curious. If you are only uh, driven by cheap stocks every day, it's going to be a very tough environment to, to work in. So you have to be very curious about uh, how businesses work, how money flows through them, whether you'd like to compete with that business or not compete with that business, um, you know, sort of what the competitive environment is. If you are driven by that and you're driven by curiosity about uh, valuation and you have a good nose for uh, a bargain, then 3D is a good place. And then I think we all have that. I mean, there are long periods when, when bargain, uh, bargains are scarce, but then we always... You know, what I would say uh, is uh, prepare the ship for more exciting weather for, for better opportunities, right? So we're always valuing, 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 trying to understand businesses. That that would be my um, my initial thought by you about what you'd said. It's just, you know, you have to read. Uh, the culture is one of reading. It's not one of endless talking. It's one of doing numbers. Um, you know, it has changed a little bit in the sense that, you know, the period where, that Tom described in the 90s, you'd sit down with an annual of a, of a German company and say, well, would I put that in the PL or would I not put that in the PL? You'd reconstruct what you thought the profits for that, uh, for that business were, you know, so that, that kind of thing. So that, that with international standards has uh, disappeared, but there's other challenges because, you know, the, uh, international standards to a certain degree also obfuscate certain things, you know, companies are forced to active, activate assets, software that maybe we wouldn't want to call assets or that kind of thing, you know. So those are the kinds of things that I think about, but I'm sure other people will have additional thoughts. Anyone else from the the panel wants to take yeah. a stab at this? Yeah. yeah. I, I, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I was simply going to say, <clears throat> yeah, you all got a chance to hear the history of the firm going way, way back. And um, I think the association of the, of the historical partners in the firm, uh, direct association with Graham, Buffett, Munger, Schloss, uh, these were incredibly important uh, relationships that really helped to build what I would describe as the steadfast commitment to this framework that we practice. And I think it's a draw for people who really want to hone their craft as value investors. And we don't hire very frequently. Um, and I pinch myself to this day that I made it to the firm 30 years ago. But I think that history, telling those stories over the years, um, Tweedy's part in that history uh, has had a really strong effect on the culture and the, the preservation of that culture over time. And if, if I could add, this is Jay Hill speaking. I'll, I'll just give one quick brief story. But I, I started in the firm at, in 2003. And I think it was 2004, 2005, when I got my first stock into the portfolio, a stock that I recommended. Um, it was a company called Lexmark. Um, we bought some shares at $60. Um, within two or three months, some really bad news came out. It was clear that the business had changed. And it was a change that I was not anticipating. The stock fell down to 40 um, and I remember just feeling terrible, feeling like, man, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> this is, they've hired me to pick stocks. The very first stock I pick um, falls a substantial amount in a short period of time. Um, and I'll never forget, Will Brown came down to my office, <laughs> knocked on my door. I thought I'm getting a, a pink slip. And, and Will Brown <laughs> said, he said, Jay, he said, look, um, this is the first time you've recommended a stock that's gone down. It will not be the last time at least a third of the time you are going to be wrong and you need to, to, to get comfortable with that. So just get back up on the horse. That was the first statement. And the second statement was, look, we're a group. The group made the decision to buy Lexmark. 
You didn't make the decision to buy Lexmark. It was a group decision. It's not your fault. It's the group's fault. Um, the mistake is on all of us. And I can tell you that from, from that day forward, um, I've had just tremendous loyalty to this firm. Um, and like Bob, I, I pinch myself every morning. Um, the day that I got hired at Tweedy Brown was really the single best day of my entire life. I'll tell one follow-on story to that. And in, in 1991, or when I joined the, the firm, one of the first things Will Brown said to me is he said, you know, this is a small firm, Bob. You're going to have a chance to make very important decisions at this firm. Every time you make a decision, I want you to think about it in the context of a 30 to 40 year career at Tweedy Brown. And so that idea, uh, we've often referred to it as Tweedy time sometimes when we make decisions because we tend to marinate on ideas and we think. And I think it's one of the reasons why we haven't made major mistakes. Uh, but it's also that margin of safety uh, mentality that is really built into everybody at Tweedy. Uh, Siman, do you have any questions that, uh, from your end? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start off with a light note. So this is from Mihail. He wasn't able to connect earlier. So he's just asking, uh, saying that, good evening from Croatia. Have you ever observed the CEE region for investment purposes? Yes, we have. We look everywhere. <laughs> that's right? that's Perfect. The, sim <laughs> the simple answer to that. And if there are no bargains, we move on. Um, you know, so we, we, we do not have a, l a lot of investment, but it doesn't mean we're not screening in the Czech Republic or in Poland or something. You know, the, but these are not very deep markets to us. But we're screening. We're screening everywhere. Tom, was, was Adris Grupa, was that? Yes, yes. Oh, that was, sure. we all, we all, that we was in Croatia. Croatia. We yeah, all, we all, all saw a small position in Philip Morris. Uh, Philip Morris, Czech Republic, yep. Yeah, Czech yep. Republic. So, uh, Raj, from, what a, from, Raj, what about what? that Coca-Cola bottler? Uh, uh, that was Coca-Cola. Coca that was at the, at the time that was quoted in Greece and it's now moved to yeah, London. Yeah, yeah. But no, no, yeah. I mean, I, I screen, I screen, and I've, I've looked yeah. at a few things. Um, you know, we've yeah, there at, are uh, companies that have significant, uh, uh, Western companies that have significant operations in Eastern Europe, among them Henkel and uh, some and Coca Cola, Hellenic. Yeah, we've and looked so. at stock, we've looked at stock spirits, uh, you know, which is a Polish business. So we, we, we look, we're looking. Perfect. Uh, thank you for that question, Mihail. Uh, second one's from David, and this one is for the panel, whoever wants, is interested. So I, he says that I would be interested to know how the team views position sizing. Do they use a framework for minimum and maximum position sizes? And how do they view averaging down or averaging up? Uh, I, can, uh, I can start. Uh, uh, our uh, position sizing is a function of cheapness, moat, viability. Uh, and how much do we have in that industry already? So if it's a great company that is cheap and uh, uh, we, we understand the mode, uh, it's of a certain size, uh, it can at purchase be a two to three percent position. Typically we start with a one to two percent position as we become more familiar over time with the business, we may increase, we may increase that that position. So uh, that's uh, that's how we think about it. If uh, if it's a pure statistical bet, then pure statistical bets generally are smaller companies in size. So as a practical matter, they may, may end up being a uh, half a percent position uh, or a one percent position. So it's uh, it really depends. Yeah, I would just add that. <clears throat> We believe in diversification, as did Graham, and typically no more than a three to four position, three to four percent position at cost going into a new name. And as Tom mentioned, usually one to two percent getting started and will build into a position. But we'll also own small and medium cap companies where we might take a half a percent to a one percent position and own more of them. A typical Tweedy portfolio might have 50 to 60 stocks in it diversified by issue, by industry, by country, by market cap, but by no means 
does that portfolio look like an index when we're done? Our country weightings, our industry weightings are radically different from index weightings. I mean, for example, I give you an example of that. Uh, in our international portfolios, we have about a four or five percent weighting in Japan, and I think in the index, Japan represents twenty to twenty-five percent of the uh, IFA index. Uh, I think we have nearly double uh, the amount of the index weight in our portfolios in Switzerland, for instance. Um, so uh, uh, we believe in diversification. Um, you know, we're driven by price. Um, and other than that, three to four, no more than three to four percent um, at cost in an individual security, no more than 15 to 20 percent in a single industry group, and no more than 20 to 25 percent in a single country when investing outside the United States. Setting those three constraints aside, then the portfolios fall out wherever value is showing up. Brian wants to know a little bit more about the intrinsic value, and he says that, could you elaborate on your process of revising your intrinsic value for impairments? How do you identify mistakes versus taking longer than expected for mean reversion? Jay, you want to take that? Yeah, I'm not sure I 100% understand the question. So so maybe re- re- repeat it again? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I'll just repeat it again. But if Brian, if you want to jump on, that'd be great as well. Uh, so it's, uh, the question says that, could you elaborate on your process of revising your intrinsic value for impairments? How do you identify mistakes versus taking longer than expected for mean reversion? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in terms of um, revising our intrinsic value for impairments, um, you, you know, if, if it's a non-cash uh, write down, um, of a, of a previous acquisition, for instance, I'm not so sure that, 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 uh, we're necessarily going to, to change our intrinsic value of the business. Um, and we've seen a lot of that over 2000, right? Er, earnings have fallen substantially for a lot of businesses because of the, because of the coronavirus. And for accounting reasons, companies have to take, um, write downs of, uh, either goodwill or other intangible investments, and, or even in some cases, PP&E. Um, to a large extent, though, if, if, if we still feel like a company has uh, a normalized uh, underlying earnings power of a certain amount, and we're confident that um, there are M&A deals in the industry that have happened at substantial premiums to where the stock currently trades, um, and, and, even, and if we're confident... We, I mean, this is something that is very reminiscent in 2020, right? We, we tend to use multiples to value companies, right? In 2020, there's a lot of uh, uh, abnormal earnings. In some cases, companies have pulled forward earnings that should have probably happened more in the future, 21 and 22, and may lead to slower growth in the future. There are other instances where companies have substantially under-earned in 2020, um, um, but we think uh, the, the potential for earnings to normalize in, say, 2021 or 2022, or even in some cases, 2023, is still highly probable. Um, so in those cases where, where you know, earnings collapsed in 2020 and from accounting rules, um, the companies had to take some non-cash intangible impairments. Um, but we still think mean reversion is a very real possibility and a company can get back to, let's say, what we think normalized earnings power is in, in 2021 or 2022 or 2023, we're not going to change uh, our, our, our appraisal. Uh, Jeff, you want to hear this last question because we're running out of time. Uh, you want to ask the last question you were going to ask the panel? Sure. sure. Uh, thank you, George. Um, Look, at I know you have many students uh, um, listening to this conference today and, and, and perhaps many beginning portfolio managers in their first job. So the question I just wanted to ask um, to anybody or all of you um, is what advice do you have for both groups about how to, ch- how to achieve success in the investment industry? can take a step, I would say um, you have to have uh, a methodology. If you don't have a methodology, you're a Petsy in this game. 
uh, it's best to have a good methodology, I would say, you know, sort of, uh, and you can develop your met met methodology and, and sharpen your weapons with which you go into the stock market by reading a lot, right? So once you have some idea, and we all know the masters and we've all read them and they have all good methodologies, some are a little bit more sort of this way and other ones are a little bit more that way. But uh, then uh, you don't change it. And it's very important that you are, that you listen but that you're also a little bit stubborn and that's um, and at the same time open to the idea that you've made mistakes right this is what philosophically one of the most difficult things to do in my mind at least that you if a stock goes down that's good because you can buy more cheaper but it, if you've made a mistake you have to consider the possibility that you made a mistake right so is it is it you know has the risk profile changed because the price is lower or has the risk profile changed because there is a, some issue that you've missed in the in the business. So with that, I would say you, you, you're well off if you spend a lot of time thinking about what could be wrong in your analysis, in, in your analysis uh, you know, how you could be wrong, how this business could be attacked, what, what, you know, sort of you have blind spots and you don't know what they are, but that's, those are important things to do. Then uh, the last thing I'd say, and then my, my, my partners will have uh, other things to say, I would say is that you have to be Try to be, I think, dispassionate. You, it's easy to fall in love with a great CEO or this or this or that. Um, you know, best not do that. It's better to fall in love with a great business, I would think. And and then the other thing is, if you spend four weeks of your life working on a stock, um, maybe you get emotionally attached. Attached. That's also not wise. The stock doesn't know that you are working on it. You know, the fact that you are working on it doesn't make it one iota more cheap. Or more expensive you know sort of every stock that you work on is a learning opportunity uh, what matters most is what, what jay and bob have said before is what you're gonna pay right so those those would be uh, my tips sort of uh, you know sort of and you spend your days reading uh, rather than than talking and don't be too partisan don't get too attached to your stocks and and think what what value is about i, mean, I think to be yeah, go ahead bob I would just hazard one, you know, today, uh, as we all know, active management's under attack. So, you know, students thinking about coming into this business, uh, the active management community is kind of shrinking while the index community is kind of growing. And I would say, don't be consumed by indexes. Uh, you know, there's almost as many indexes as there are stocks these days uh, of all shapes and designs. And there's simply other active portfolios is the way I look at it. And so I think, you know, if you're comfortable with what you own, if you like what you own, if you're intellectually curious, you like the hunt, you like the search, you think in absolute terms about your wealth building over time, then value investing is going to serve you extraordinarily well. But bear in mind that Ben Graham never promised an index beating return. When you, when you look at the uh, intelligent investor where he describes the difference between investment and speculation, he describes that investment operation as one, of, one which upon thorough analysis promises safety of principle and an adequate return. Operations not meeting these requirements are speculative. Now, the, the wonderful thing about Graham and the elegance of his model, right, was the cheaper the stock, the lower the risk and the greater potential return over time. A wonderful uh, construct. And I, I think um, that's something that will continue to work over time. It's going to work inconsistently. They're gonna be incredibly difficult periods that are uncomfortable for you. But if you enjoy the hunt, if you really understand what you own, I know the way we feel at Tweety. I don't think any of us wake up thinking about an index at Tweety. Uh, we wake up thinking about the next undervalued security and how we can compound our wealth at an attractive rate while taking very reasonable to low risks. And that's what value investing have, has afforded us. And fortunately, over long measurement periods, value investing has added value. So um, 
Anyway. Yeah, I, I would add to what Bob has said very, very briefly. We can, uh, <coughs> we uh, it's, uh, it's very, imp- uh, uh, like Charlie Munger, I believe the temperament is extremely important. You have to have the right temperament, and you have to be passionate about, uh, about reading mysteries. Because investing in a company is like putting together a puzzle um, in a mystery novel. Uh, well, our end of time. Uh, thank you so much, all, for willing to share the celebration of 101 years of Tweety Brown Company with us and make us realize why value investing is not dead and why it will never be dead. <laughs>